I'm so pleased to welcome Ardhana Kovala. She is the CEO of Aptimine Partners, and we have known each other for a few years already, and always I admire her so much when she speaks and all the topics that she brings up that are really current and hard-hitting, and that shows that what kind of advocate she is for uh, women's empowerment, uh, diversity, inclusion, and activist in, for education as an agent of change. And uh, we have seen that the many th topics that she talks about are not what she speaks about, it's what the people she speak, talk to will speak about, and that I think makes it even more important uh, while she's speaking on those world stages. So welcome, Artana. So great to see you today. Samarik, I've been looking forward to this all week, so thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to see you again. We are looking at now, uh, we just turned uh, from 2023, and now we are in 2024. I know it's kind of a, a fake thinking of, that you cut off a, a year from one to another, but I think it's uh, obviously there's a lot of things that are overlapping. But uh, could you share uh, with me what your, what your thoughts about uh, 2023? What are some memorable moments that you have that you experienced that what were some challenges or perhaps some wins that you had during that time? So this is an interesting question, one I haven't been asked, but um, interesting nevertheless, because I think actually it was a lot more challenging, Samarik, for leaders and decision makers than even the COVID years or the, you know, the Im immediate boom that followed in our industry. I mean, think about this. Just when you thought the inflation was high, it rose higher. Just when you thought the interest rates can't go any higher, central banks raise it to levels we had not seen in 20 years. And obviously we had wage inflation and that affects both the employer and employee budgets. So we were all in the middle of it, right? We saw some uh, mid-sized banks in the US and even in Europe collapse. We, um, we had the great resignation, which was the new buzzword in our industry. Geopolitics was insane. We had two major armed military conflicts when really one was more than any of us really wanted to handle. I thought, especially in the major economies, there was there was a fear of a recession lurking around the corner. Oh, it's going to come now. So we really didn't know. And there was a host of uncertainty. And if all of that wasn't enough, I think business leaders and organizations were dealing with a host of other macroeconomic shifts. Think about it. 2023 was all about AI. Climate change. And there were real discussions on how it affects us in our daily life. Diversity, equity, and inclusion became front and center. We saw high profile, uh, a host of high profile labor strikes. Authentic leadership and what it means um, from a culture perspective was a big debate. We saw a lot of <laughs> performative action, right? People, leaders talking the talk, but not necessarily walking the talk. And we also saw real action I'll give you a random example from the World Cup football where the national team um, of one of the teams refused to sing the national anthem as a protest. I mean, my God, we saw comedians in television really shake up the world of consulting. I'm talking about the John Oliver show. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yes. We also saw um, corporate leaders uh, become more powerful than elected political leaders in some weird way. I mean, take the example of Elon Musk, who decided to st send the Starlink to Ukraine as defense and then refused to send it again when, when it was not defense but an attack. So you take all of these things that are happening and imagine this. In 2024, half the world is going to polls. There are elections in 60 different countries. Oh, yes. And as we speak, there are four wars waging in different parts of the world. So as I look towards 2023, good riddance, thank God it's over. But I can guarantee you in 2024, we can expect the disruption to continue. You know, when I started the year, I wished for this year to be one of radical change, but this is why people tell you, be very careful of what you wish for because you might just get it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I, I could see that. I mean, uh, when I've been reflecting on, on 2023, it was a sort of uh, uh, most moments that I felt like crying because things are, I'm not sure how this can happen map out and uh, you can appreciate uh, being in Helsinki or in Finland, we are in, in elections uh, election and uh, now we have a uh, big decisions being made 
uh, one of the two candidates who, who will uh, be the president for the next six years. And uh, uh, there's a one million, million and a half voters that haven't made, who are undecided. The young student, the students, the young people are undecided. So all the candidates, both candidates are in TikTok uh, doing whatever they can to entertain those <laughs> uh, young undecided voters. So these are actually very big, uh, huge times for us. And we are also actively looking, well, what is the new leader going to do for the country looking forward and how they are, how they are going to they can reflect to, and improve the conditions. So I'm sure this is, we are, Finland is one, one country, and we're looking at the other countries who have the same issues. So it will be very interesting times. Exactly right. Couldn't agree more. Exactly right. Yeah. And it's all happening at once. I mean, <laughs> um, yeah. That's like the perfect storm, right? So. Yes, yes. But can you talk a little bit about just a, a personally what you felt was some, some of the uh, things in 2023 that... Uh, uh, kind of, uh, you, you remember it with a kind of a smile when you wake up in the morning and that, ah, oh, I'm glad this worked out well. So I think uh, I am uh, extremely optimistic about the young uh, taking front and center, really expressing themselves. Um, and I think that is going to change a host of things. Uh, I'm optimistic about the young leaders uh, holding the older people who are in positions of power accountable. So you can't, you, you can only bull, bullshit your way through to an extent, which is amazing. So the kind of accountability that we're seeing from the youth, I think, is very, very inspirational. And because of that, we will see a whole whole lot of things change um, in the system. The other thing that I can think of, which I'm really, really happy about, is you see at some point, um, corporate strategy and sustainability strategies were running in parallel because most organizations were doing the two. There is the business part of it and there is a sustainability part of it. And that is always a reason for conflict because at some point these strategies are going to diverge. Yes. Uh, and resulting in a you know conflict in decision making, right? But I'm increasingly seeing that the corporate strategy and the sustainability strategy is being integrated. And once you do that, there is none of that conflict because when you make decisions, whatever investments we make must be sustainable, and whatever sustainable investments we have. They have to be profitable. So, you know, when that convergence happens, th th there is less of that conflict, which I think, um, which I think is extremely positive. The third thing I'm seeing increasingly now, so I'm, I'm big on startups um, and I have a diverse portfolio. Either I advise, invest um, or, um, you know, uh, mentor them. And I am so impressed with the next generation because historically as a company, you have existed because your job is to turn a profit. But today, the startups and the young uh, entrepreneurs that I'm speaking to, they are so wired uh, or they're wired so differently that they want to play a role in improving the world by reason of their company existing. So there is a, there is a big focus on humanity, spirituality, and who you are as a person. Uh, so... Entrepreneurs now are saying, my business is not just to make profit. Yes, it is important. But my business is just as much to improve the world and impact humanity. Unheard of five years ago, but I think extremely, um, extremely heartening yeah. and enormously encouraging. How about the, for startups? I mean, they, they are relying on getting investments. And uh, are the investors seeing say, in the same way that uh, what I've heard uh, so many times that the investors are looking for a quick, quick buck, quick return on investment, and they uh, they, they listen to sustainable, all these nice uh, uh, goals and so on. But at the end of the day, they say, "Well, I like to be able to get my return in five or not longer than ten years." Uh, what challenges are, have you seen that the startups are running into, or are there some alternatives where they can get their funding uh, and to actually, with, with investors who are looking, uh, have a vision similar to theirs? Yeah, so I think it's, it's uh, look, we will never, we will never not have firms which are purely for profit and have that moral code where that's their raison d'etre. And that's perfectly fine. We're not challenging that, right? But I think what is happening is there is an increasing awareness 
both from the entrepreneur community and from the investment community that you can't only be one thing. There is merit in trying to solve some of the societal challenges when you're existing even as a for-profit business. And I think that is the beauty where there is, I guess, a heightened awareness. And by and large, even within, I think, the investment community, like I wouldn't touch a startup or an entrepreneur or even a, a, a consulting mandate, which is only a pure for-profit mandate. Yes. yes, you have a business to run. Yes, we all want to be profitable. But you also, I think, by virtue of being a business, have an explicit responsibility to make sure your business contributes positively to the world at large. And if you're completely bypassing that or ignoring that, I would bring that leadership to question. And I think there is also, by and large, Samarik, I guess more of an awareness that leadership is not just a solo solo journey, right? We, we, it's a shared journey. So um, I'm very happy about the fact that amongst the young and old, there is less of leadership, but more of weedership. So there, there is a kind of a transition away from, uh, you know, I, me, myself, to we, us, other things, which I, which I think is um, positive. Very good. Yeah, you are very active in in uh, in, uh, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and there are all the changes that you have seen uh, evolving. I have only read about those things, but could you share a little bit of what you saw in uh, leading into 2003, and you believe in 2024 uh, onwards, uh, with the kind of um, move and the vision that the leadership has for. Saudi Arabia that will actually contribute to the kind of topics that you are advocating for? So I think we are at a very special time uh, specific to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia because it is one of those rare occasions where political will is combining with financial will to really make massive changes on the ground. And the success story in Saudi Arabia is not just that it's one of the fastest, um, it's it's one of the countries with the fastest growing GDP, or it's, it is actually the core of power, not just in the just not just in the Middle East Gulf region, but the world by and large as one of the G20 economies or uh, that oil price is booming or that they're building uh, pretty much a new um, destination by a week. I think the real change in Saudi Arabia, which is the best part, is how social transformation is really driving the change in the kingdom for generations to come. Look, um, as a woman and specific to gender, is everything perfect? No, it is not. Mm. But show me a country where things are perfect because no country is perfect, right? We all have problems in the Western world and we have an easy way of sitting in judgment for what's happening in the rest of the world. But I think that is a very, very short-sighted and unfair way of looking at things because I like to judge things based on what's happening on the ground and I like to judge things based on the progress chart and if that curve is going on the right direction and I think it is phenomenal there are 37% women in the workforce um, uh, more women graduate from universities which is true also universally um, uh, this number of women who have founded startups and got funded as startup founders in um, in um, Saudi Arabia is higher definitely by a wide margin than Europe so I think we are seeing unprecedented change, but also at a pace which uh, which is quite literally unfathomable, but spectacular. So in, in Saudi Arabia, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the population, the age, the average age, age in, uh, uh, they're quite young, I mean, the overall. Yes. I mean, is that what, what below is the, 70% below the age of 30 or 35. So that explains a little bit about the, where, where the direction now the leadership has been taking to to embrace those topics and, uh, and the vision that you, you talk about. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. I mean, it's been a long time since I've been uh, in the kingdom, and I think I would, uh, I would see a little bit of a different place now if I would visit again. Oh, everything, yes. You will, you will be completely, but you should go, because I always say um, media is not always fair with what they speak of, but if you see the influence that Saudi Arabia has commanded, not just in the world stage, but what they're really doing on the ground. Um, historically, your career as a young 
Saudi uh, would be in oil and gas. But now, if you talk to the youth, and they've done huge surveys with sizable sample sizes on this, where travel, tourism, and hospitality is coming as one of the bigger careers, including for women, which I think is absolutely fantastic because the big visible projects are all projects in tourism and they're doing so well. So makes sense. But I think um, hugely encouraging for the next generation. Right. How is that then uh, looking at sort of uh, longevity and uh, rev revolution and uh, people are, uh, are uh, more active in, uh, in, the, uh, in the senior years and there is a, really a shift of uh, uh, traditionally people have retired when we were 50 or maybe 60. But the, now, uh, people in the 70s are, are very active into the 80s and even longer. Uh, as long as the health uh, is okay, they will be very active. So where do you see this now leading to the way uh, people are uh, involved or given the opportunity to be involved in, 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 in business or, or have an active uh, career still? Look... Traditional stereotypes of career paths, I think, are going to collapse completely in the face of workforce change and the longevity revolution, right? We're all living up to 100 these days, which means we're going to have multiple careers, perhaps multiple marriages. <laughs> but more importantly, we're definitely not retiring at 65, but working well into our 70s and 80s. And at some point, that means we're going to have five generations of workforce in the office at the same time. Now, it's going to throw up interesting learnings. We will need a, a lot of cultural adaptations. In my view, it is extremely, extremely positive, but there will be a reorientation period. Now, think about it. In our industry, so historically, a college degree, I'm talking managerial roles, were a, a requirement for yesterday's jobs, right? But in 2024 and beyond, not really. So what we call the degree ceiling or the paper ceiling of a degree is crumbling and it's completely being replaced by skills. Again, in our industry, we have a genuine problem with finding labor or, or talent. And when, when you have the labor shortage on one hand, degree requirements they kind of like a random limitation which can completely be done away with. And I'm increasingly seeing organizations um, hire excellent candidates with completely divergent backgrounds, skills, degrees, and sometimes no degrees, which is brilliant. And the other thing we're seeing is people are changing industries completely at some point in their careers, right? Like in, in um, last year, uh, LinkedIn did a survey, and again, a good sizable sample size of 20,000 workers. And they found that two out of three had already taken a career break. And one out of three who hadn't were thinking or planning on taking a career break at some point. Sam Eric, 10, 10 years before, you know, in our career, impossible, right? We were not thinking of career breaks and then joining a completely different industry. So a typical career paths like this, I think, is going to become mainstream. And traditional career paths where, you know, you join a company, you rise up the ranks, stay 20, 30, 40 years um, to get to the top and then retire at 65, I think that is completely passe. Uh, one out of five Americans, 20%, age at 65 or more were working in 2023. That number is double than what we had 35 years ago. So it is completely going to change the landscape and there will be an adjustment period, but I think um, extremely positive for our industry specifically in the end. Yeah, and also I think it's very interesting that there is a kind of a learning curve for, uh, for companies that are hiring well-experienced uh, people who are who are in their 60s or maybe late 60s and so on, because there is a generation difference here. And I think it takes uh, uh, from, uh, from all sides uh, kind of an open mind and also to be willing to learn and adapt to the new conditions. Uh, let's face it, you know, when you are in the 60s and 70s, you, you don't work as fast, the, the uh, digital applications as somebody in, in their 20s. But if the fact is that they are... The, they understand this. So they are looking at what are the, the skill set that, that the very experienced person has. They can do it, same thing, but do it a little bit slower. They might do something much better than somebody who has a very, very little experience. So it is something that you have noticed also that when people talk about these, the, the different generation, up to five generations in the same workplace? Absolutely. So in your 20s, 30s, it is so much about your raw brain power, while 
the minute you're over 60 uh, that's when the accrued experience really defines and refines the decision making so it is not as much about the raw brain power but about um the the, the better decision making you get attuned to because of your built up experience now put the two together it's magic it's yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what does it require from the from a leadership now? I mean, the, uh, the, the leadership, the senior leadership of a company, uh, what is their role in all this? <laughs> this is actually interesting because I think um, uh, you have spoken um, extensively about culture in your show. And I know we have discussed a lot about culture and it all comes down to that. Yeah. Because one of the things, and I know it's going to become even more important in the future because culture is not a buzzword anymore right it is it is a real deal it is everything so uh, i know we are both foodies and i know we speak a lot about food so imagine a pizza with eight slices culture is one part leadership one part your values it's one part strategy one part judgment and four parts enabling is enabling others to achieve but it's easy for us to intellectualize about it but it's actually very elusive to actualize because you ask four people what um authentic leadership or what culture is and you will get probably eight or 10 different answers because not many people can really pin it down but i have to say one of my all time favorite quotes has been that culture eats strategy for breakfast every single day and i think i if i'm right it, i think it was warren buffett who said another favorite quote which uh, which goes something something like who you who you pay who you promote and who you profile within an organization says everything about your culture so let's let's take that as an example right so the person you hire the person you promote the person you profile let's say in your company pictures if that person is the biggest brown noser you're letting everyone in the company know what you value or on the other hand if it is someone who pushes and um challenges the leadership uh, then you're fostering a culture of psychological safety and you're actually showing that you have an open appetite for someone who is completely different so culture is the open and visible signals that you're sending all the time but as a leader it's what people really do when you're not looking so what they do in uh, you know behind uh, behind your back and it's especially complex if you're talking about large corp- organizations right because yes. by and large they still play it safe uh, now i'm not judging that because the risk reward is not proportionate for doing a whole lot of changes so it's often safer to stay in the comfort zone there are political implications there are personal implications and let's also be dead honest right sometimes samaric homogeneity is comforting in a team where everyone gets along with everyone and everyone is kind of alike you know there is peace and no fights but is that a truly diverse and inclusive culture Uh, I'm not sure. And mm. more importantly, is that the best culture that you can have in an organization? Definitely not sure. Yeah, I have noticed in organizations that uh, who are uh, thriving and and growing, they are uh, it takes a lot from the leadership and particularly they are uh, they have to also le- learn uh, some, uh, certain skills that were not considered to be the leadership's requirement. They have to be quite a, uh, open, vulnerable, they have to show that they don't they don't know everything. They have to be able to Uh, accept that uh, this is not the hierarchical situation yes uh, as uh, the ceo of a company you make those big decisions but you have to be able to face the music when somebody mm-hmm. who is in the, in in the entry level uh, uh, comes up to you and say well i think this is not right sir you know uh, yeah. you have to consider this and uh, if they are willing to put aside their egos and personalities i think they that will actually show the respect from everyone in the organization that they are open for for a change that comes from everywhere Absolutely. I mean and you nail it on the head because if you're following the news on what the next generation identify as things that really matter to them, what they want discussed, be it at Davos or the G20 or any of the big meetings where the political leaders um and and business leaders are converging, it is the same things. Inclusion, climate justice, education, access and authentic leadership. where leaders are comfortable comfortable enough to express their vulnerability yeah 
The big thing now that was uh, maybe it's a little bit over a year old uh, when Chat GPT and the, the artificial intelligence publicly be made was made available uh, on uh, that you can uh, download for free or use for free the Chat GPT and ask a lot of questions and uh, if you don't know the answer ask chat dpt but be critical of uh, what the answers come but uh, how have you seen the ai or artificial intelligence now uh, evolving into let's say to tourism and what are the implications now where are we going with this uh, uh, it's it's a it's a it's a topic that it comes up every single day yeah and look i think um AI is going to become mainstream and either as an industry or as a business in the industry, you're in it, in with it or not. And I'm a big tech optimist and genuinely believe AI is going to create but not diminish opportunity. I think, again, 20 people, 20% 20 of people, employees actually fear that AI is going to replace their job in the next two, three, four, five years. But I think it's actually going to result in a lot of redesigning of jobs and repurposing of talent. And it is not a bad thing at all. But again, we underestimate how hard it is uh, to disrupt the status quo, especially when things are working as it is, right? In our industry, we always uh, get this thing where, you, where, where something new comes in. Oh, but we've always done it this way. Just because you've done it this way doesn't mean it is the best way going forward. Or oh, it has to be this way, right? So I think business leaders in our sector who actually proactively develop explicit strategies to navigate AI will give their organizations a big, massive competitive advantage. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the hotel industry has been usually the ones who are very slow in adapting, but I think one of the things that I noticed was uh, uh, came COVID, things changed over the pandemic, and also the customer expectations were very different at the time that they want to have things that they didn't traditionally require. But and somehow the AI start to play a role in, in the pre-arrival arrangements and so on. And so now it's a it's a natural thing. And AI is it doesn't replace a, a smiling face when you arrive to the hotel, but it's for the pre-arrival and also uh, handling data collection and also actually knowing much more about your customers than you ever knew when they use cleverly the AI. And, abs and if it's just a redundant job, which can be done by a robot, why are we still holding on to it? Yeah, exactly. Right? In that, um, yeah, the, there is no joy in ensuring repetitive, redundant tasks have to be performed by a human. That's why technology exists. Yeah. Well, I think finally I want to talk about the vulnerability, that uh, it's okay not to know all the answers. Uh, how do you see it? I mean, you have talked to some of the world leaders in the industry and... Uh, uh, what have you have been your impressions about this kind of approach to to uh, leadership and, and also running a business? So, look, um, a big part of authentic leadership and being authentic as a person is being vulnerable and being able to express it. Uh, like you said, not knowing all the answers, even as a leader, is okay. Crying is okay, both for women. And men. Um, and I can give you my personal example. Um, what happens when you have held responsibilities ever since I can remember from a young age or positions of power and you've actually done well holding responsibilities is that you get very good at delivering what life expects from you what your work expects from you and what people around expect from you. That's personally and professionally. But that is not to say that's necessarily what you expect from life or you want from life or it's the best expression of you as an individual and as a person, right? So it's not necessary that you're fulfilling your best, biggest potential um, as a human being. And there is a second part to it, which is the visible manifestation of what people see and perceive of you, which is what they see and perceive of you on social media. And I have a big 
or at least a growing distrust with social media because a lot of what you see is false. It's a highly curated experience, right? We don't see it when we consume it. But there are people behind the scenes who are picking the one ideal picture, which is the best angle, the best light, where you're looking the thinnest, I don't know, from 20, 30, 40, 50 pictures. Um, and don't get me wrong, all of that can make you hugely popular all of that can get you 100,000 followers. But are you really memorable as a person? It's not authentic, in my opinion. It's not showing your vulnerability, as in my opinion. Because at some point, people buy into the perception of who you are and the image that you portray, right? So mm -hmm. they don't really see who you are as a person behind the mask. And my bigger question is, if others' perception of you what if at some point it's not personally fulfilling to you anymore? What do you do then, right? Because we, we all are taught to have a target, go after the next goal, crack that big dream, be in the C-suite before you touch 40. But what if you've outgrown that, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, goals are good, targets are good. You know, these are all nice, but it is also perfectly okay to be in a state of vulnerability where you say you know what I don't want I don't know what I want in life yeah. or it's also perfectly okay to be vulnerable and express and say um, my passion my purpose or my dream actually has changed because I have changed as a person and we should all do we should change as people because that's that's what's reflective of growth in a human being right what happens is we get so good at working efficiently. We optimize, uh, uh, you know, everything that works around us. So it's all clockwork. Everything works like clockwork. So what is technically supposed to free us really begins to cage us at some point. There is a, there is a fantastic quote I read somewhere which said, go to work, send your kids to school, follow fashion, act normal, Walk on the pavement, watch TV, save for the old age, obey the law. Repeat after me, I am free. And it just made me laugh. And don't get me wrong, I'm still grappling with all of this, but increasingly aware of it and um, increasingly getting better at expressing my vulnerability as well. It's OK. You know, you might be called um, uh, <laughs> emotional or high maintenance or uh, criticized uh, um, for being what I am, but that's OK, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think it's very, this is very well said. I, I also uh, feel the same because it was not a... Uh, the way in the area times when I grew up and, and started my career, uh, you, you held back all your emotions basically, and now it's a, to the contrary. It's a, and now of course I I'm only reached a, a senior age, so I, I really don't care. I, I just tell you the way I feel, and sometimes I things are uh, uh, in one way. I mean I, I'm not obnoxious about it, but I'm <laughs> I'm very ready to. Uh, open up and say, well, hmm, I, I, I feel bad about this or, or this didn't go the way I was hoping for, but that's, that's quite okay. Absolutely. And again, you're only as young or old as you feel and as you think you are. So yeah. uh, forget about senior age. You're nowhere there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I totally agree with you. I'm the first one to say that. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, talk about uh, just uh, what are you looking forward for the 2024? What are the something that you are... Yeah, you, you made your probably, knowing you, you have a list of things you want to achieve and so on. Are you able to share something? No, but listen, I'm, I'm optimistic. I think, like I said, I am still wishing for radical change. Um, if there is one thing I would really change, uh, and that's specific to our industry, as you know, I'm passionate about diversity, equity and inclusion in all forms as a woman, um, as a feminist, as a womanist, actually less a feminist, but more a womanist. Uh, and I hope we I hope we change as an industry where we stop pigeonholing people especially for women. Don't get me wrong. As an industry, we've grown leaps and bounds and the amount of uh, importance that I see placed on all things diversity and uh, you know inclusion is unprecedented. We've never seen that in the past. But I, again, 
say that, you know, there is a tendency to put people in boxes. It is an easy thing to do in our industry, right? She works in travel tourism and hospitality. So that's her box. Uh, she works, she's a travel tourism hospitality person. So why is she talking about wellness? Or why is she talking about diversity, equity and inclusion? Because someone should. And because the magic of being a woman is actually you're able to do different things. And my question is, why not? Right. Uh, do many things and do them spectacularly. Um, so I think that I wish would change where people would question less where you come from, but talk and are genuinely concerned on uh, concerned about where you want to go. So I'll give you an example again from a diversity, um, uh, gender diversity perspective. As a woman, you're told you can do this, you can do this, and you can do this, but in order. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, get married, uh, choose between your family and your career. And if you're choosing one of the two, it has to be done in order. So family first, and only when the kids are grown enough to leave the house, come back and focus on your career, but not the two things at the same time. And it kind of beats me because the idea still is that if you are a powerful CEO, you must be male and you must have a homemaker for a wife. And God forbid, if you're a woman and a leader, you must be either number one, childless, be a terrible mother, or you must have your mother looking after your children. No, it doesn't have to be any of those things, right? Um, so it's it's all of these pigeonholing that you can't be good, credible and good looking uh, at the same time. Why not? No. <laughs> you know, in, in my case, I face this all the time because if you take a mesh of all of these things um, and add to the fact that you're a five foot three inch um, um, immigrant, self-made woman of color who speaks with an accent as my kids constantly make fun of me, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> it's what you call a perfect storm of factors. <laughs> I, wish, <laughs> I wish people were less judging yes. of how you look, um, where you come from, but more accepting of what you can do and bring to the table and how much of a difference you can make. Well said, Adhana. Thank <laughs> you so much. I think this was a very good uh, discussion and uh, I'm so enthusiastic uh, when I speak with you and also uh, I look very much forward to what the, the rest of the year and in the future will bring. So thanks very much again for joining me today. It has been my pleasure, my honor. Thank you for having me, Samarik. Always great to chat.